coming weeks, I want to write a sort of love letter to America, the country where I've lived and worked as an art critic for more than 25 years. It won't be uncritical, it won't be without its gripes, but it definitely will be an expression of gratitude for what its creative life has shown me. I want to show something of what we can tell about Americans from the things that they've made, and how these images act in the story of American experience. When we look at them through the lens of their art, what do we see? fascinated by the ancients. Classical Greece, Republican Rome. The values of these civilizations became American ideals too. Democracy, civic responsibility, public virtue. Their imagery saturated American culture right from the Republic's beginning in the 18th century and continues in weirdly mutated forms sometimes down to the present day. What would the founding fathers have made of this modern site of American classicism, Las Vegas? To them it would have seemed eerily familiar and yet scarcely recognizable. They thought the classical column held up the Republican temple of virtue. We prefer it to support the popular palace of middle class sin. Today there aren't too many classicists to a place like Las Vegas, but the allure of Rome, like old Baron Tiber, just keeps on rolling along. Except that it's a different Rome, not the virtuous republic of George Washington, but rather the late empire of Frank Sinatra and Bob Buccione. Caesars and senators, centurions and slave girls, the Rome of Hollywood of excess of authority, heavily overlaid with pasta, meatballs and pets of the nut. There are places in Italy where you can still escape the classical past, but in America it's not so easy. This is Caesar's Mall, a moon colony for shoppers in the Nevada desert, with a sky that cycles through from rosy dawn to purple dusk every half hour with computer-controlled lights. It is not what 18th century Americans had in mind when they called for a public architecture based upon the severe forms of ancient Rome. The new republic was weak, only its ideals were strong. Classicism gave it a language of power and authority and of continuity with the past, even though it was so new. To choose a new capital is a radical act for any state. The founding fathers of the American Republic didn't want to take an existing city like New York or Philadelphia and just call it the capital of the United States of America. They wanted a clean slate, a very American desire, an empty site where the Republican vision would not be blurred by earlier royalist and colonial meanings. 
place they chose in 1791 was empty all right because up to then nobody in his right mind would have wanted to live there. It was a tract of hot, humid marshland beside the Potomac River with a few tobacco farms and a large and rich variety of animal life, mostly mosquitoes. But this was to be the site of the new Rome and they called it Washington. A mere hypothesis at first, just a bunch of lines on a surveyor's map, but it was to grow into the most powerful city on earth. of the revolutionary leaders, among them George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, were large, and they found expression in the plan for the capital of the new republic. It takes its form from the greatest metaphor of royal autocracy in France, the gardens of Versailles, designed by Le Nôtre for Louis XIV in the 17th century. Washington's designer was also French, an engineer named Pierre L'Enfant. Versailles' imagery of great corridors of power radiating from the palace becomes Lanfort's plan of grid and boulevards. A hugely ambitious design, and it took more than a century to fill it in. And yet this ambition allowed the founding fathers to show how they rejected the Englishness that was all around them. This had become one of the more disliked buildings of the old regime, the English governor's palace in Williamsburg, capital of the colony of Virginia. Its architecture is English, not French, in origin. The balcony signifies government by proclamation, the governor issuing his orders from above to the king's subjects below. When you, the colonist, entered the hall and saw the 774 weapons that decorated it, you might have been reassured by the display of military power. And if you had any republican thoughts, you might have been intimidated. But this kind of building, and the town it anchored as an image of royal authority, had nothing like the symbolic charge that the American revolutionaries imagined for their architecture. A young man who studied law in Williamsburg wrote that its architecture was in the worst style I ever saw, and said of Virginia in general that the genius of architecture has cast its maledictions over this land. This was Thomas Jefferson, and he would become the third president of the United States. But he was an architect before the revolution. His father gave him a classical education, a political background, and thousands of acres of rural Virginia. By 1767, he was designing himself a house on a hill deep in the Virginian countryside near Charlottesville. He called it Monticello. He was to work on it, tinker with it, for the best part of 40 years. Monticello was pervaded with enormous aesthetic ambition. It was also this great amateur's spiritual center, his hearth, and his refuge from the painful stress of political life. If I had to pick one person from all the dead Americans that I wish I could talk to, that man would be Thomas Jefferson, and the reason is the overwhelmingly attractive cast of his mind. He was one of those rare people who want to build everything up from first principles and do it without a trace of fanaticism or self-pity or cant. He was the living proof of William Blake's dictum that energy is eternal delight. He was revolutionary, statesman, diplomat, president, constitutionalist, educator, farmer, botanist, and the founder of American architecture.
Meeting him, you feel his enthusiasm and curiosity on your face like sunburn. He lived far beyond his means and was constantly in debt from the huge sums that he spent building and furnishing Monticello. And under the surface of the 18th century Whig reasonableness, there is something immoderate and crazy about Jefferson, and very important from my point of view, he was the patron saint of all do-it-yourselfers, a fact to which Monticello bears witness. He was always looking for details of convenience. The portholes in the wall up there above his bed are there to ventilate his winter wardrobe. He designed a machine to make copies of his letters, and he wrote about 18,000 of them over his lifetime. He designed a clock to record the days of the week as well as the time of day. Cannonball weights moved down the walls past the day markers. Unfortunately, the hall of Monticello wasn't high enough, so he had to cut a hole in the floor and put the rest of the days in the cellar. Jefferson's masterpiece is his University of Virginia in Charlottesville. He saw that education was the key to the life of the new republic. He believed in what he called natural aristocracy, a elites of talent and virtue, not of birth and privilege, which education could create from the ranks of ordinary Americans. It was dedicated, he said, to the inimitable freedom of the human mind. It would be a pure expression of the Enlightenment without any input from religion. For Jefferson was a secular humanist through and through. How today's religious right would have disliked him, and how very little he would have thought of them. The campus, which Jefferson called his academical village, is built around a lawn open at one end, so that, in a symbolic sense, knowledge and wisdom could radiate down and out into the American landscape. It is made of pavilions, set on increasing spaces as they recede from the eye, like a Palladian stage set. Each pavilion has classrooms at ground level and professors' quarters above. Between them are the students' dorms. Each of the ten pavilions is built in a variant on the classical styles of architecture. Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, and so on. The pavilions, said Jefferson, are cubic architecture. But the climax of the project, the Rotunda, begun in 1823, he called spherical. It was based on the Pantheon in Rome. Within is the library, the round cranium of the university, literally its brain. Light floods it from the round skylight above, representing the power of nature. The books radiate the power of reason. Originally, Jefferson wanted to take this metaphor further by painting the dome sky blue and having gilt planets and stars moved across it by a sky clock. Even without that, it's a pristine space, a precinct of intellectual light, clarity and harmony. To me, this is the most beautiful room in America. Once you've seen it, you understand why Jefferson wanted to be remembered not as President of the United States, but as the author of the Declaration of Independence, the founder of religious liberty in Virginia, and the designer of this university. Even after a century of glass and steel, when we think of public buildings, we still think of columns and porticos. The very first temple form political building in America, or indeed the modern world, was the new State House in Richmond, Virginia, designed by Jefferson in 1785. Jefferson was totally enraptured by an ancient Roman temple he visited in Nîmes, the Maison Carré, or Square House. Here I am, madame, he wrote to a friend in Paris, gazing whole hours at the Maison Carré like a lover at his mistress. 
he had a stucco model made of it and shipped it back to Richmond, and he bullied the legislature into accepting it as the basis of the new design. At the core of the State House, where the statue of the god would have gone in a real Roman temple, there is a figure of George Washington. It was commissioned in 1788 from the French sculptor Jean-Antoine Houdin, and he gave America its first really good public sculpture, a superb display of neoclassical style and intelligence. Insofar as a single figure can, this expresses an idea about democracy. It shows the statesman as citizen, not a king, not a god, but first among equals. Jefferson specified that the size should be precisely that of a man. Anything bigger would be pretentious. So we don't see Washington as victorious general. He's a new Cincinnatus, the Roman hero who was called from civilian life to lead the army and return to his farm after victory. He leans on a bundle of rods, the Roman fasces, each rod a state, their union connoting strength. His sword is sheathed, and then there's the plough, the symbol of agrarian virtue and the planting of a new political order. Udall's final touch, a marvellous one I think, is Washington's missing button. It lets you know that he's not a stickler for protocol. Democracy in dress. Founding fathers were more of a secular elite than Americans commonly imagine. Jefferson and Washington were both Freemasons. This is the largest Masonic temple in America, built in Alexandria, Virginia. It's modeled supposedly on Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem and dedicated to George Washington, whose flame is kept alight by the keepers of the shrine. But now inflation has set in. Washington is not the size of a man, he is a bronze colossus, four times life size. George Washington, of course, was the most prominent Freemason. Harry Truman was a devoted Freemason. He dedicated a statue of George Washington in 1950. Over 50% of those who signed our Constitution were Freemasons. Uh, over 50% uh, who signed the Declaration of Independence were also Freemasons. And we have had 14 presidents documented as being Freemasons. And their conduct in office pretty well uh, indicates to most of us that they have had good moral training, which probably was the result of the obligations that they assumed when they became Masons. Masonic imagery was so important in the politics of the American Enlightenment that it even found its way onto the dollar bill, the eye of universal knowledge above the pyramid with the motto, a new order of the ages. In the 20th century, it would be lampooned by the American Dadaist Man Ray with his satirical sculpture made from a metronome called Object to be Destroyed. But the biggest Masonic image of all was the monument to George Washington in the city that bears his name. 555 feet high, the biggest obelisk ever made, beyond the wildest dreams of the pharaohs. The Washington Monument is so much a part of America's mental landscape by now that it's hard to imagine anyone ever objected to it. But they did, vehemently. The 
political fuss and bother over the designs was so great that this one wasn't actually approved until 1848, nor was it finished until 1885. And in the meantime, every imaginable faction got in on the act. Some politicians thought the simpler designs didn't pay enough respect to the great Washington, and other people thought the more elaborate designs made him out to be a Caesar or a king, but not a Democrat. At one point it was even proposed that all the surviving veterans of the Revolutionary War of 1776 should somehow or other be brought to Washington where they would each fling several shovelfuls of earth on this site, thereby creating a large mound over the memory of the great man, a kind of national anthill. But in the end, an army engineer came up with a perfect and abstract form with a steam elevator inside to get people to the top, the tallest stone structure in the world. Its critics compared it to a stalk of asparagus, and Mark Twain thought it looked like a factory chimney with the tip broken off. But it is also a colossus whose figure is absent, sublimated. Its impersonal beauty takes your breath away. It's the midpoint between the first heroic style of America, neoclassicism, and the last one, minimal art. The profusion of monuments in Washington make this city into a sort of theme park representing the tides of history. Each monument is partly a shrine and partly a ride. Abraham Lincoln described the aura of the American monument when he spoke of the mystic chords of memory uniting Americans with one another through their past. The Lincoln Memorial, designed 50 years after the President's death by Henry Bacon, is deservedly the most famous. Its colossal figure of Lincoln by the sculptor Daniel Chester French sits enthroned in a temple like Zeus, gazing down the main axis of the city towards the capital. When you move into that great memorial and you look up and you see the statue of Abraham Lincoln, it's impressive. But let me say that when you turn and look at the words inscribed on the marble, and read the words of that second inaugural. I think it is the most beautiful piece of literature written in the English language. I can hardly read it without tears because of what he was saying to the people. Remember in Britain, you have the pageantry, you have the monarchy, you have all of this that is a glue to society. It brings people together. It creates community. And we're trying to do that with our architecture, at the same time maintain our democratic concepts and ideals. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up. Monuments live by use and die by neglect. The world is studded with dead monuments. The Lincoln Memorial was revived by civil rights rallies 30 years ago when Martin Luther King and hundreds of thousands of African Americans transformed and refreshed its meaning. This was doubly ensured by television, which for so many Americans is the main organ of social memory. That one day on the Red Hills of sons of former slaves and the sons of former slaves. If the cadences of King's speech fit the classic form of the memorial in a way that reminds you what has been lost in our age of sound bites, the speed and pseudo intimacy of TV have killed the classic ideal of the heroic monument just as they destroyed great rhetoric. Years ago, I was interviewing Albert Speer, Hitler's architect, and I asked him whether the vast monumental designs of Nazism would have been any different if there had been television in the Third Reich. Well, of course they would have been, said Speer. We could have put the Fuhrer in every living room. We could have done for him what the Americans did for Kennedy. It's absurd to imagine today that anybody would get a political edge from having a statue of himself. Politicians buy television time instead. Ronald Reagan, who was television incarnate, knew this in his bones. Once we know our politicians on television, there's no way of imagining them back into bronze or marble. 
Can you imagine anybody giving a hoot what a statue of Reagan or Bush or Bill Clinton would look like? But media images, that's another story. completely successful American memorial commemorates the American dead of the Vietnam War. Almighty God, as we stand here this Veterans Day in the shadow of the Vietnam Memorial, inscribed with the names of those who gave their lives in the Vietnam War, particularly pray for those veterans of Vietnam and the families of those whose names are upon this black granite wall. May this memorial continue to be a wall of healing for all those who come with wounded hearts. Oh God, we pray for men who are in our hearts. Mine a long time. You know, try to forget. You can't forget. And this just brings it out and helps bring it out and helps heal. It makes a lot of My twins were in Vietnam. It's Terry and Jerry. And Jerry got wounded and Terry was killed on the same day, February 21st, 1967. Jerry can't come down here. Jerry's moved into a world of his own. So we come down here to see Terry, me and his family. And look, he's right here where my lips can reach him. He isn't up high where I can't reach him or down low where I can't bend anymore. He's right here in front of me. It was designed by a young, unknown woman, an architect's student called Maya Lin. And before its dedication in 1982, it ran into a barrage of criticism as fierce as the objections to the Washington Monument a century before. Right-wing critics attacked it as a slur on the memory of the dead. It was furiously denounced as a black gash of shame. Those polished granite walls, below grade, bearing no effigies or mottos, but only the names of the 58,000 American dead. The living see themselves reflected in those walls, visually united with the dead. They take rubbings of the names. They leave flowers. It has become a tremendously charged focus of memory, transcending the bitterness over the most divisive war that America had fought since the Civil War itself. It is the best public sculpture, the most loved, the most consulted, made in America in 50 years. A monument without figures, only names, completely the reverse of traditional depictions of heroism in war. Yet it was also an American who changed the way heroic action was painted two centuries ago. He was Benjamin West, the first American painter to influence English art. He did it with this picture, The Death of Wolfe, painted in 1770 and commemorating General James Wolfe, killed by the French 11 years before in the act of capturing the city of Quebec in Canada. Wolfe must not die like a common soldier under a bush, West had said, and indeed he doesn't. He is expiring with eyes turned to heaven in the posture of the dying hero, with his grieving officers forming an arch above him. It culminates in a billowing flag whose thrust indicates the direction that Wolfe's soul will take to heaven. It also alludes to the empty cross in a deposition, linking Wolfe's body to the image of Christ. On the left is his second in command, and with him are an American Ranger scout in the green coat, pointing towards the defeated French, and a thoughtful Indian sitting on the ground. 
There were no Indians with the English forces at the Battle of Quebec, but West brings this Mohawk warrior in to signify natural nobility, contemplating the heroic sacrifice of another tribe. The death of Wolfe made Benjamin West's reputation. Crowds flocked to see it, it became George III's favourite picture, and it generated a healthy amount of controversy. Why? Because West had chosen to paint a modern incident in modern dress. Thereby, he flattered all the conventions of history painting. Under those conventions, the figure of Wolfe would have been a naked hero off a Roman bas-relief, and his staff officers could have been wearing antique armour and togas, and they might even have been a genius of victory swarming around up there in the sky with a scroll. But West American pragmatism wouldn't put up with that. And by refusing to paint the immediate past in terms of remote antiquity, he gave a new lease of life to English history painting. Not that this turned into an exercise in realism. Very far from it. Benjamin West had been thought a prodigy ever since he arrived in London in 1763. After Sir Joshua Reynolds, he became the second president of the Royal Academy. Not bad for a self-taught Quaker's son from Pennsylvania. No American artist, at least until the 1980s, had ever been more immovably convinced of his own genius. In his Academy self-portrait, you see a man who, at the age of 12, had announced that my talents will make me the companion of kings and emperors. And as a matter of fact, it did. He became George III's favourite painter. But West always found time to help other American artists who were trying to make their way in London. His studio was open to them, and here it was painted by one of them, Matthew Pratt, under the title The American School. The best painter who came under West's aegis in London was the Boston portraitist John Singleton Copley. Copley was Boston Irish and born poor. His mother ran a tobacco shop, and he had to pull himself up by the bootstraps in what was, from the viewpoint of painting, a desert. Boston had no professional painters of any standing, and they were seen as craftsmen, like tailors or cobblers, which, Copley admitted, is more than a little mortifying to me. But he stuck to his easel and carved himself out a career as portraitist to the solid, expanding merchant class of Massachusetts, Tories mostly, including figures like Jeremiah Lee, whom he painted in full fig at full length and girth with his wife for their mansion north of Boston. Copley's career really begins with this little portrait of his half-brother called Boy with a Squirrel. He was 27 years old when he painted it, and he knew that his best hope of breaking into a wider professional sphere lay in London, and specifically with Sir Joshua Reynolds. Without the support of such people, he would always be a provincial. But with their support, he could go anywhere. So he put all his acquired tricks into it. The scene and reflections on that mahogany table, the minute rendition of the hairs of the little glider squirrel, the glitter of the gold chain, and the rosy flesh of his half-brother's face. He sent the canvas off to Reynolds in London, and after an agonizing wait of several months, word came back that the great man approved. Something really new, it seemed, had come out of the American wilderness. But Copley was a timid man, and he didn't get to London for another nine years. Business in Boston was too good. He married into a rich Tory family, but his subjects weren't all Tories. Some of them were figures in the coming revolution, like Paul Revere, the silversmith, who was one of the leading dissenters in Boston. 
Copley's portrait of Revere is a manifesto of democratic American pride in skilled work, the radical as craftsman. No finery here, he sits in his shirt sleeves, thinking, confronting you. The stolid dome of his head rhymes with the teapot that he's holding. Sober, workmanlike, materialist, obstinate, those are the adjectives for Copley, and nowhere more than in this portrait of Washington's aide and future governor of Pennsylvania, Thomas Mifflin, with his wife, Sarah. Very plain, the only note of bright colour being a little flower on Sarah Mifflin's bodice. This is marriage seen as enlightened equality. Conventional 18th century portraiture had the wife looking admiringly at her husband. Here, it's reversed. Sarah Mifflin fixes us with a slightly questioning gaze, while her husband looks at her with manifest pride. An ideal republic of two. Copley never got better than this, and American portraiture seldom did. In 1778, Copley poured the lessons of Rome and London into a history painting in the grand manner. Except it was an odd kind of history painting because it wasn't about an important public event. It was commissioned by an English trader called Brooke Watson to commemorate something awful that befell him when he was a young man in the slave and sugar trade in Cuba. He'd fallen over from a boat in Havana Harbour and a giant shark chomped his leg off. In some ways, Watson and the Shark reminds me of those pious ex-votos that one used to see in rural chapels in Spain, where a picture is commissioned to celebrate your miraculous delivery from a landslide or a lightning storm or a shipwreck. Except, of course, that it's a very sophisticated painting and it is full of art historical illusions. A Roman statue called the Borghese Gladiator, rotated through 90 degrees, gave Copley the body of Watson. The figures in the boat owe a lot to Raphael, especially the Raphael of the tapestry cartoon known as the Miraculous Draught of Fishes. Despite its classical quotes, it's a melodramatic painting, and that shark charging out of the milky green sea can still give you a nasty turn. It was meant to be scary, to signify the uncontrollable, remorseless power of nature. Jaws the first. Probably he'd never actually seen a shark, though. This one has no gills, and it has lips like a toothpaste ad. Most startling to a modern eye is Copley's treatment of the black crewman. Blacks up to now had only figured in American art as servants, slaves. But this man is given the full dignity of an individual. He anchors the composition, he holds the line that is to be thrown to Watson, and in his calm and apparent concern, he acts as a sort of Greek chorus to the horrific events on equal terms with the whites. Copley took no part in the revolution. He stayed in England. But the revolution made the career of another American artist, an embezzler's son named Charles Wilson Peel. Peel became the Young Republic's first resident history painter, an ardent patriot, a populist on the extreme left of the struggle, who idolized its leaders and fought at Valley Forge. His big iconic subject was Washington himself, whom we see here, after the Battle of Princeton, leaning on a cannon like a farmer on a fence, big bone, small-headed and very American. But Peel wasn't just a painter. He was, in a sense, America's first cultural entrepreneur, a showman. Here he is, at age 81, lifting the curtain on his world of wonders.
Keel invented the American Museum to bring into being, as he put it, a world in miniature, showing the natural marvels of America. What would it do? It would improve the Republic. As ours is an age of discovery, he wrote, every experiment helps to expand the mind and make men better, more virtuous and liberal. One such discovery would help change American ideas about America's own prehistory. Not all Americans liked the newness of the new world. They would have preferred to be able to point to something at least and say, this is truly certifiably old. And after 1801, they could, because in that year, some people digging in a glacial bog in New York found the remains of a gigantic prehistoric animal, a mastodon. Now, today, every kid knows about fossils, but 200 years ago, the very idea of an extinct species didn't exist. Yet there it incontrovertibly was, older than any human artifact and certainly different to any living animal. It implied a new conception of geologic time. And this so excited Peel that he rushed to the site and took over digging the thing up. In this picture, the exhumation of the mastodon, Peel depicts a critical moment when a violent thunderstorm threatened to flood the pit in which the skeleton lies. In the pit, there's a buzz of wet activity. A half-naked worker triumphantly holds up a mastodon bone. On hand are Peel and his own children with an enormous drawing. They're there to witness the great moment and will themselves carry on the saga of American self-discovery. They were quite a clan. Peel didn't just want to make a museum, he wanted to make artists to fill it. His wife bore ten children, eight of whom, male and female, became painters, an all-time American record. They were named after old masters, Raphael, Rubens, Rembrandt, Titian, and so on. Such tricks of illusion became Raphael Peel's own stock in trade. He was the first American to devote himself to still life painting, recording every pore and highlight on the skins of fruit with a fine brush and almost enameled paint. These are the actual objects that are used as models. With Raphael begins an ultra-illusionistic vein in American art that would later become enormously popular in the 19th century because the public liked to think of the artist as a sort of trickster, a con man. Rembrandt Peel was the most talented of the clan. This is his portrait of his brother Rubens with a geranium. Rubens, despite his name, was half blind, and here he sits for his brother looking mild, sweet and myopic, affectionately holding a plant, which, in America then, was a botanical rarity. The Peel children grew up in an ever more confident nation. The English attacked America again in the 1812 war and once more were beaten. This prompted a wave of nationalistic fervor and with it a desire for ever grander state architecture. no more grandiose building in America than the Capitol in Washington, the seat of American government. Its dome was to be a replica of the Pantheon. Later, it was enlarged to the size of the Dome of St. Peter's, ribbed with thousands of tons of iron. Our Capitol building is the affirmation of our community. The whole building really represents sort of America uh, in progress, America a new nation, America an evolving nation. Uh, if you want to really understand the United States of America, I think that knowing the history of this building gives you that marvelous uh, recitation of our history. 
you look up and see the paintings in the dome and you see the magnificence of that structure, well, I have a sense of awe. Uh, it's the third largest dome building in the world, St. Peter's of Rome, St. Paul of London, and our Capitol building. Its designer was a Bostonian, Charles Bullfinch, America's first native-born professional architect. In the rotunda, Bullfinch left room for eight huge murals of scenes from American history. Now, at this point, America didn't have a great deal of history, but its leaders felt that historical paintings in the grand manner would have an improving effect upon future generations. And only one man seemed right for the job. Bullfinch's friend, a pompous, irritable, deeply patriotic, and moderately gifted artist called John Trumbull. Congress commissioned him to paint four moments from the American Revolution, and he finished the job in 1826. They are large, and what inspiration they have is spread fairly thin. Competent and worthy are the words that spring to mind, I guess. Two were political, George Washington resigning his military commission, and most famous of all, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, which a sceptical congressman, irked no doubt by Trumbull's huge fee of $32,000, and objecting, as congressmen still do, to the spending of government money on the arts, called the Great Shin Piece because of its forest of 18th century carves. Not all Americans in the 1830s felt so secure about the future. Arcadian America was passing, but what was coming? The fear of decline began to nag at the edges of American consciousness, and one of the men who gave it memorable form was a transplanted Englishman, Thomas Cole, who produced a cycle of five paintings as a warning about the rise and fall of civilization. He called it the course of empire. The first phase he called the savage state, primitive hunter-gatherer culture in the wild. The next phase is Virgilian, the birth of religion and the arts. The Stonehenge-like temple with smoke rising from its altar, the grazing of flocks, an equivalent, maybe, to Jefferson's ideal of a nation of yeoman farmers, an agrarian republic. This is the social balance, the Eden, that Cole feared was threatened by impending political events. For in 1829, America's seventh president was sworn in on the steps of Bullfinch's capital. His name was Andrew Jackson, Old Hickory, a rabble-rousing populist Democrat from the Indian-killing frontiers. And he put the fear of God into the establishment, including Cole's patrons, who viewed him as a potential dictator. The lessons of what can go wrong with the state unfold in the third painting, which Cole called the Consummation of Empire. No more the agrarian virtues of Jefferson's Republic. Instead, populism has created mob rule, and the mob has thrown up a dictator who gives them a culture of spectacle and excess. And, in triumph across the bridge, here comes Caesar, followed by his train of subservient intellectuals and bought senators. Cole didn't actually give him Andrew Jackson's face, but he didn't feel he needed to because he thought the moral would be clear enough. There is something rather pretty about Cole's version of the awful delights of Imperial Rome. No orgies. But he clearly had a great time doing the architecture of this marzipan city column by column. In its nutty grandiosity and bathroom-like newness, it looks forward to Cecil B. DeMille. And he hints at what is coming. Those little children have learnt about aggression. They're staging a naval battle in the marble pool. And a boat is sinking. 
So when they grow up, these bellicose little beasts bring down stage four, destruction. The empire is corrupt. It has fallen to the barbarians amid scenes of rape and pillage and mayhem under a stormy sky. Cole's viewers at the time would have thought of Edward Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and perhaps of the English burning Washington. And now history cycles back to its beginning, a wilderness with ruins. To me, this is the best painting of the five, and in it, Cole is trying to convey the skepticism of Edward Gibbon through the language of Claude Lorraine. But the anxiety that he expresses is very American, too. It's going to turn up at intervals all the way through American history, and especially much later in the Cold War. It's the fear that this culture, so new, so strong and shiny, can nevertheless be swept away in one catastrophic eye blink. Except, of course, that for Cole, the threat wasn't nuclear, it was moral. This is not the primal landscape of the first America, full of possibility, an innocent slate upon which anything can be written. But its exhaustion may be the prelude to rebirth, another cycle. We don't know, and Cole doesn't tell us. But that image of the ruined column, seen from where we are now, becomes a haunting prelude to the end of America's own mounting moral crises in the 19th century, which would explode in the civil war between the industrial North and the slave-owning South. This is Oak Alley Plantation in Louisiana, and it reminds you of how the most extreme uses of architecture as a fantasy about classical civilization were being created here in the Deep South. Everyone who's seen Gone with the Wind knows the idiom, white pillars, avenues of ancient trees. Now, ancient Athenians didn't live on this scale, but industries like King Cotton created tremendous wealth, and since these planters believed their true model was the slave-owning elite of ancient Athens, they built as they felt the Greeks would have done if they'd had the luck to be born Americans. Despite its belief in preserving an aristocratic way of life, the slave South between 1800 and the Civil War produced nothing in the way of painting or sculpture that could compare with the achievements of the North. It was the songs of the slaves that would create a new American music by laying the deep roots of the blues and of jazz. But in the visual fabric of the master's life, there was no ferment. It was provincial and gracious, but not inventive. Stagnancy was built into Southern culture in all areas except architecture. There, the longing for a classical past still functions as a powerful image of nostalgia. Understandably, I guess, most Americans visiting the great antebellum houses prefer not to think too much about the atrocious system that put them there. The black bodies under the white columns don't show up in the restorations. Yet Charles Dahlgren, who built Dunleith House in Natchez in Mississippi as his town residence in the 1850s, didn't feel that he had anything to hide. Like all his fellow planters on the eve of the Civil War, he was completely convinced of the immovable rightness of slavery and of what it brought them. This place isn't a mask for anything. In places like this, I think of William Yeats's lines on the great country houses of Ireland, which run, Some vile and bitter man, some powerful man, brought architects and artists in, that they, bitter and violent men, might raise in stone the sweetness all had longed for night and day, the gentleness that none had ever known.
was once a colossal plantation house near Jackson, Mississippi, burnt to the ground in the Civil War in 1864. An American pastor, worthy of Piranesi, or perhaps of Thomas Cole. The end of empire, and also maybe the end of the Jeffersonian belief in classical architecture as the sign of democracy. Americans would go on to build millions of classical columns, north and south, but none would have quite the purity of meaning they had once possessed when the Republic was new. Visit American Visions at PBS Online and further explore the American experience through art at the address on your screen.